Now, a new book explaining the most important developments in modern physics might seem an unlikely contender for a bestseller, but here it is. I'll hold it up for you. Seven Brief Lessons in Physics, which is written by the Italian theoretical physicist Carlo Rivelli, has beaten off top competition from the likes of Fifty Shades of Grey even, to become the single best-selling book in Italy this year. The book has sold more than 300,000 copies and has been translated just now into English. And I'm delighted to say its author, Carlo Rovelli, is here with me. Very good evening to you. Thank you very beautiful much. Beautiful book, beautifully covered everything. Why did you write it? Uh, I think it's, uh, I'm telling a love story between me and uh, science. Why I got excited with it, why I find it so fascinating. And uh, also because I think, uh, all things considered, people don't know how much the world uh, image has changed in the last century. So I try to say it simply and clearly, just to the bone. It's beautifully written and it's in seven lessons. So tell us a little bit about some of these lessons. Each one is on a big chapter of, uh, the, uh, of, of modern physics. The first one is general relativity. Space and time are not what they are. Uh, second one about quantum mechanics and so on, step by step. And then there is a peculiar one, the last one, which is not really about physics. Uh, I ask, uh, um, what are we, human beings, in this strange world uh, uh, made by atoms and particles, bouncing particles? And yeah, I the try question, to give the question you're asking is, what is I? Yeah, what is I in all this? It's not an easy question, no. but I give Do a you perspective. Answer it? Uh, one of the many strange things that nature produces, no more, no less but a fantastic thing, like many other fantastic things nature, produ nature produces. What about time? Um, can I borrow your watch? You can, as long as you uh, give it back to you, me. You'll get it back, I promise. <laughs> I'm Italian, but I'm... Um, if you take two watches, you move one up and one down. You wake a li little bit, and if the two watches are good, better than yours and mine... Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, much better than a common watch. Um, what you discover, and this is, uh, can be measured in any physical laboratory, good physical laboratory, we have very good clocks, um, time goes faster here. Mm -hmm. So after a while, your watch, which is higher, is a little bit ahead than mine. Why? Because uh, uh, the, the right question is, uh, I, I'll give it back. Oh, right? thank you. We are, we are <laughs> thank you very much. Um, the right question is, why not? Right? We have uh, the idea that time is the same all over the universe, that time passes, uh, but it's just our prejudice, our sort of natural, because we don't have a good uh, enough perception. Um, by studying more, by looking more, we discover that nature is different than what we think, time is something else, and time passes at a different speed, depending on the altitude, depending on movement. Is that what you do when you come up against something? You, you ask the why not question rather than the why? Yes, of, very often yes, because very often the, the difficulty of science is not so much having new ideas, that's easy, is to understanding what's wrong in our assumptions, in our prejudices. It's getting out of ideas which is hard. I noticed your sixth lesson is on the probability and the heat of black holes. Yeah, black holes are among the most fascinating <laughs> objects. First of all, because time goes very different inside a black hole than outside. Time slows down horrendously near a black hole. And then because, uh, you see, when I started uh, uh, at school, they told me that black holes don't exist. But they do exist. And now they... Did you ask why not? <laughs> trying to understand. Um, so now black holes are normal things uh, that astronomers see by hundreds of thousands in the sky. Uh, but nevertheless, what happens in the center of a black hole is completely mysterious. And uh, I think, at least for me, the beauty of science is not what we have learned. It's uh, all the mysteries that are still there, the things we don't know. And that's what I try to describe in the book, the, 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 the the beauty of being on the boundary between what we know and what we don't know. I'm going to read the last couple of lines. That's terrible, isn't it, to read the last few lines of a book. Uh, but it doesn't really give away a plot or anything, no. so we're all right. Here on the edge of what we know, in contact with the ocean of the unknown, shines the mystery and the beauty of the world, and it's breathtaking. Now, that makes me have goose pimples on my arms, but what do you mean scientifically by that? I mean that uh, um, it's an enormous emotion for us learning something new, changing our view of the world. Uh, and uh, in a sense, uh, it's similar to a work 
work of art. A great work of science is like a work of art. It's like Shakespeare. Like you listen to Shakespeare, you have strong emotion, and you learn something about human beings. You study Einstein, it's a, a great emotion when you understand it, and you learn something more about uh, the universe. Very, very briefly, you sold, I sold Fifty Shades of Grey. How does that make you feel? <laughs> Uh, surprise, I'm not used <laughs> <laughs> to it. I'm trying to get used. <laughs> Carla Ravelli, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you. Thank you very thank much. You.